Welcome back to Watchbox Studios. Tonight we are talking Patek Chronograph, Rolex prices, Sane and otherwise, Damasco's new chronograph and overlooked dive watches from mainstream brands. All of that in viewer wrist shots plus mad listings and bad listings. All right, guys, I want to emphasize there is no better place than the watchbox.com to buy, trade, and sell luxury watches. In fact, it's where I buy and sell my own watches. And I need to remind you, because you've been entering faithfully for the last month or so, we are giving away an Oris Arctic Audi Sport GMT, and we're naming names tonight. This is the night I'm giving that thing away, guys, and I've got it here with me. It's going to a new owner this evening at the end of this show. Okay, guys, batting practice, warming up with your pitches and my cuts, the return of time to run. This is always our leadoff. Run far, run fast from these listings where we name and shame the worst of the web's ads. While we're at it, guys, can we get the center monitor back on? Okay, viewer James L. of the UK kicks off our comic relief for for the evening with this Chrono 24 Rolex listing. And let me remind you, this is a Rolex listing. So it's a Rolex Daytona, sort of. Aside from the indifferent photo focus and squalid fingers in the image, you're in luck because guys, this is the mythical day date Daytona. Yes, you've heard the word and now you can see, sort of. Those photos aren't great. But you have a radial date at three o'clock. We're off to a good start there. You have the day of the week at nine and heck, why not a 24 hour dial at six o'clock cause Rolex 24 at Daytona, right? Okay guys, now this might have been a harmless joke. This could be a bad listing for a bad watch priced honestly, but here's where things get sinister. There's the price. 15,000 Swiss francs is a lot of money being asked in earnest. Although if you do read the fine print, it's negotiable, highly negotiable. I hope the watch is claimed to be in white gold and well, I'm calling BS there too. No box, no papers. Actually that part, I believe. That, that part, I believe, that's credible. <laughs> I'll also say the seller does note that the watch, a claimed 2016 model, features engraving, and I will bet you money that the watch is engraved with this, because hell, why not go whole hog? Just like Little League Trophy Day, everyone can be a winner with this watch. All right, friends joining from around the world. I can see Sean Masonet joining us. I can see Fjord Prefect P. Y7, long time viewer, Russell 996, time P, Long Mac, Jan Wilhelm Koster, Jason Reeves, Hell Bop, Avi B, Alexi from Finland, and Edward Ledden from Sweden. Guys, thank you for joining me from around the world. We've got a lot on our plate tonight. We got another bad watch listing. All right. Our next listing, Gone Wrong, hits close to home and was spotted by our friend Joel D. And this time the perp is us. Haha. <laughs> thank you. That's an awfully Teutonic looking watch for a name like Jacques Hedro. And I have to admit, the Langa is our default image when loading slides, and that's doubly ironic since we're not Langa dealers yet on the Gaufberg side. If you find a bad listing online, let me know to name and shame and improve the breed, especially if the ones shooting an own goal, to use the British phrasing, are us. You guys are like my crackers and hackers finding all of the flaws in the system. You were improving the breed and I couldn't ask for a better group of QC testers. Okay, help me name and shame and improve the breed. Across the web, send your bad watch listings to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Torsten L. leads off with our viewer questions. Tim, has Rolex become overpriced? This is a great question because it has two answers, not one. Yes and no. You get a ton of refinement for the MSRP of any given Rolex. That's GMT, that's Sub, that's Daytona. Consider a favorite of mine, the Explorer 2 216570 Polar, the white dial Explorer 242. 8100 new, available, used all day long, including just a few months old, for between 7500 and 8000 This is a five-year warranty. Epic toughness, one of the world's best dials and bracelets. The solidity of a Rolex steel bracelet rivals gold from any other brand. And remember, resale strength for this watch, which basically sells used for what it costs new, is honest and solid. Uh, but things start to get nutty with other models. There we go, my guys just got the center monitor back up. <laughs> now I can see what you're seeing. So things start to get nutty with other models in the pre-owned Rolex space. Let's discuss the green sub, because this is where we start to see watches selling used 
used for more than they cost new. So five years ago, these sold pre-owned for less than list, and today the list is $9,050. Wait lists stretch to years, and the going price for a model in production since 2010 model year is anywhere between $10,000 and $13,000, depending on condition, accessories, and warranty remaining. Now, this is still a solid place to put your money. You're going to pay a premium to buy it used, but it's still a solid place to put your money. I think even buying at $13,000, you are never really going to see this shed value, even if there's a market reversal, even if the top of the bubble bursts. This is a foundation watch at a reasonable premium above list. Now, real problems start to emerge when we discuss pre-owned steel ceramic Daytonas and the new steel Pepsi GMT. This is where we start to go, to use a phrase lately in the news, to crazy town. As discussed, retail price remains reasonable for the Daytona and the Pepsi GMT at $12,400 for this watch and $9,250 for the new steel Pepsi. But pre-owned has become a bubble, and I'm not going to lie about this. We have an interest in selling these pre-owned, but I'm going to be honest about pricing. We sell new and pre-owned on the Govberg and Watchbox sides, and this is one time where I'm going to say you're better off buying new. First, paying double retail, which people are for both of these models, is simply crazy. It's nutty. It's, I gotta have it first on the block, but there will be a hangover economically. And the Milgauss GV in 2007 is the closest thing I can compare to what's going on now with the steel ceramic Daytonas and those Pepsi GMTs. This thing back in 2007, at the height of the subprime mortgage boom and the green glass Milgauss craze, went for twice list on secondary markets. Do you know anyone paying twice list for that watch today pre-owned? No. Like I said, this is the time to get on the wait list, suck it up, buy new, and pay list, because you'll never lose if you do. If you pay double, Godspeed. Okay. Moving forward, I want to say that scarcity isn't a problem with the steel Daytonas, and the Pepsi GMT is likely to follow. Right now, there's real inventory. If you go on Chrono or you go on eBay, you can find real photographs of dealer inventory in steel ceramic Daytonas. There are lots of them out there. Everyone asks crazy money. Uh, think 1989, 1990 with the Ferrari F40, a bargain at 150 grand new. At 1.5 million, you're going to lose your money for a generation if you bought that car at peak. You've got your money back today, but you really want to hang on to a supercar that you rarely drive for 30 years while paying insurance and maintenance. There are costs. When you're at the top of a bubble, there's no place to go but down. And right now, like I said, buy new or just buy a different model. Okay, Paul F. asks, and I can see we've got a lot of friends joining right now. Uh, Jason Reeves saying, I won't pay list for a Milgos, nor should you. You can buy them pre-owned at considerable discount. And right now, Matt Foster, change drinking game to Rolex or FP Journe. Yeah, you know, I haven't mentioned much JLC on the show lately. I'm not even wearing JLC tonight. You guys are going to have to come up with a new scheme to get drunk while I talk. Paul F. asks, hi, Tim, whatever happened to the Omega World Time watch? Okay, guys, a quick rewind here. This was one of Omega's annual super watches in platinum, a small family of limited editions that grows each year, never by more than a few dozen pieces for every model year. In the shadows of Omega's mainstream Basel releases, these are often watches announced before or after the show. And the insane 2017 Seamaster Aquatora World Time might go down in history as the most ambitious and extreme member of this club. It was a late 2017 out of cycle, out of the blue release with very little press. So 87 pieces were made, or they claimed 87 pieces were made, with the world time complication displayed on a dial made of solid platinum and cloisonné grand faux enamel. This was genuinely impressive from a mainstream brand. This was Omega doing a Patek 5131. Now, I'll say this. Omega's home city of Bien displays Paris from the World Time Ring, and yellow gold was used exquisitely. This is how you use yellow gold on a modern men's watch to garnish the dial. All of that said, the most intriguing fact is that they made 87 examples of the unique caliber 8939, which leads me to believe there must be a World Time Aquaterra coming, because I can't believe they would make only 87 movements at Omega, a company that does everything in the hundreds of thousands. So. Today, the watch remains catalogued. The question is, what happened to it? The watch remains catalogued today by Omega at $48,600. So 
For all intents and purposes, Omega is still advertising this as a thing you can buy new, and I'm guessing they still have some examples. This is one of the watches, one of the few watches I would bet Omega only makes to order. Probably a few pieces for flagship boutiques and everything else by request. That's a heavy load to keep in the case without a buyer secured. And I'll also say this, not only does Omega continue to offer it with a price, but they have it mocked up on their website with a NATO strap. <laughs> I love it. I actually think it looks better on the NATO strap. For those of you who want to go Panerai Tack War with a solid platinum complicated Aquaterra, here's your chance. For the marginal cost of adding the NATO, it's practically a steal. Now, for once, I'm not 100% certain that this is a watch that exists, but if you order it, I know Omega will hand deliver. Okay, by the way, guys, the Aquaterra has been a hell of a platform for standard three-hand dates, annual calendars, GMTs, chronographs, regatta timers, and now world times. It is the everything Seamaster. Okay, viewer wrist shots. Philip C. kicks off with the rare and exotic white gold Patek Philippe Aquanaut Anniversary 5168G, 42 millimeters white gold, blue gradient dial, and impeccable taste of poolside entertainment. We are now officially the Patek Philippe of live streaming watch shows on YouTube. Thank you so much, Philip. I want to add Josh B. Shares a slick, khaki-clad Aqua Racer Caliber 5. I love the green NATO. It looks sharp. I could wear one of those myself. Josh B., I salute you. Raphael C., next up, travels in style with his JLC Master Home Time. Not only a versatile watch, but the caliber inside there, the 975, is the toughest and most modern JLC sports watch caliber you can buy. Tank tough in an elegant case. It is a gorilla in a tailored suit, and your own tailored suit looks quite nice, Raphael. Ball Y rolls with his Rover and his episode-appropriate Rolex Anniversary Sea Dweller 43. That's the 126 Six zero zero. Hang on. Nope. My bad. That's not. I I lied. Chastened. No, actually, I am. I'm sorry. I'm going colorblind. That is, in fact, the anniversary Red Sea Dweller 43. It will recur. You shall see that again in this episode. Okay, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels, guys. All right, jumping back now. Yanni S. asks, what do you think of Damasco's new DC-80? This is a great question because, A, a brand we rarely discuss, and, B, a watch I was thinking of buying for myself. So, Let's back up. The Damasco DC-80 chronograph launched late last year as the first entirely in-house chronograph by Damasco of Barbing, Germany, a small family-owned brand founded in 1994. They're sort of a mini-rival to Zinn. If I had to describe them, that would be the closest explanation in a nutshell. Now, it's a 42 millimeter steel chronograph with a radial 60 second and 60 minute display. By the way, you want to know why I'm thinking of buying the watch? Take one guess. <laughs> so, the color scheme is right, but you can buy a black and white two tone version without the green. So, it's basically just like a Zen Easy M1 or Easy M1.1, which, by the way, is the watch I'm wearing tonight. So, you have that radial seconds and radial 60 minute display with a movement that is based on the architecture of the 7750, but the bridges, the plates, the wheels, the jumping mechanism for the 60-minute register, all made in-house. They also make the case in-house. They make the bezel in-house. They make the coatings in-house. They make the steel themselves. They are a remarkably integrated manufacturer for a small concern. The watch itself is an aviator style with bi-directional bezel. Loom is excellent, but again, it does feel highly derivative of the watch I'm wearing tonight, the EZM 1.1 and the EZM 1 before it. But pricing between $2,700 for the watch on a strap with standard steel case and about $3,500 for the watch on the exquisite bracelet easily undercuts Zinn, and Bremont for that matter, another brand known for simple and hardened sports watches. Damasco builds all of the movement bridges, plates, wheels, and even the world-class bracelet that can be requested as an accessory with this watch. I think we have a picture of that right there. That thing is built like a watch, the bracelet itself. All of it ice hardens, so it's almost impossible to steal or scuff, and Damasco hardens its own steel, builds its own bearings, and even equips proprietary components as minute as unique bezel bearings, bezel coatings, chronograph pusher sleeves, and crown assemblies. But, and here's where things tar start to take a bit of a dark turn, and I gotta warn you, small brand, scattershot customer service, especially abroad. 
Quality control and service questions do seem to dog this company, and this is where I get a little bit nervous recommending it and choosing it for myself. One crank on the internet complaining is nothing. Disregard that. And occasional horror stories can be dredged up on forums for every brand ever, but there does seem to be something enduring and chronic through the years and across forums over many different usernames about customer service issues at Damasco, and it seems to affect many regions, not just one nation or continent. The dark side of having so much proprietary tech in a watch made by a small family-owned brand is that you need proprietary tools parts and training to work on them or honor a warranty claim. Lubricants and silicon escape wheels made in-house are great until you need service in Ohio or Shanghai. And the one variable with Damasco customer service, from what I've gathered through research, seems to be the quality of the independent distributor for the brand in your region. Like a bunch of small manufacturers, Damasco does not entirely control its distribution abroad. So unless you live near Barbing or Regensburg, Germany, where they have their factory and mono store respectively, that's the mono store, and can deal directly with Damasco, I consider any phone call to your local Damasco distributor as you would a hiring interview. Ask probing and revealing hard questions. I want to love this brand, and I want to love that watch. But again, it's a small brand with limited resources and scattershot customer service questions spread over decades of internet history. Ask your questions. Forewarned is forearmed. Okay. Guys, let me see what's going on in the chat box right here. Bobby Smith joining. Good evening, Tim. Peter K. Yuck. I can see he's not a fan of that watch. And I can see right here, Bill Cosgrave. Um, there's a little bit of confusion between Damasco and Damascus Steel. Damasco is a brand that makes its own steel. Damascus is a type of steel that is no longer made, but is apocryphally sold by many who use the characteristic carbided surface pattern to sell it as Damascus steel. That's a question for Jason on Friday, though, guys. He is the authority on blades. Okay, jumping back. We have a question from Ronnie D asks, Hi, Tim. My dealer has given me a shot at a Patek Philippe 5968, that is the new Aquanaut chronograph on wait list, front of the line, however, on the wait list, or I can accept an existing pre-owned dealer's offer of a Nautilus 5980-1A in steel with blue dial for $75,000. Which would you accept and why? Well, let's be, let's be clear. First, let me give you your, your facts of the matter, they're both great options. If you buy the Aquanaut, you're gonna wait about a year and a half and you're gonna pay $44,000. If you buy the Nautilus, you're gonna get it now, but you're gonna pay 75 grand for a pre-owned watch. So let's talk about what each offers. Okay, the Steel Patek 59, 68 Aquanaut Chronograph launched at Basel World this year. It was the big splash for Patek Philippe on the tool watch side, easily eclipsing the perpetual calendar Nautilus. It's the first Aquanaut Chronograph, and the wait lists are in fact very long, stretching two years. The Nautilus 5981A, the steel version of the Nautilus Chronograph, launched in 2006, and by 2013, that party was over, so they're not making any more of them. Mechanically, it's identical to the Aquanaut Chronograph, just as the Aquanaut is identical to the Nautilus. So, the 42.2 millimeter Aquanaut Chrono is less common, it's new, you're gonna get it with a warranty, and it's likely to stay hot for a little while, so if you wanna get in and get out, you can probably get out with any damage, having worn the watch, enjoyed it, and then recouped your investment. That said, the 40.5 millimeter 5980 in steel is discontinued. It is still a hot watch, despite being old, that trades far above list, and it's going to stay that way. Just as the Aquanaut is likely to stay hot for a while, this is probably going to stay hot forever. And they're not making any more of them. It wears far more easily, too, on a wrist below 17 centimeters in circumference. That bracelet fits compact. This is a 40.5, the Aquanaut is a 40.2, but that overlooks the fact that an Aquanaut, especially on a strap, wears huge. It's like a 41 millimeter Royal Oak on a bracelet. Think of it two or three millimeters larger than it is. And right now, because Aquanaut straps are exceptionally stiff and the new Aquanaut Chrono is only available on a strap, depending on your wrist size, you might want to just avoid. My choice is the Nautilus. It's the Cadillac to the Aquanaut's Buick, or for you European types, it is the Audi to the Aquanauts Skoda, 
both nice, but the Audi is just more special, and the Nautilus remains a little bit more iconic, a little bit better recognized, a little bit safer as a bet if you have to put that kind of money into a watch. Uh, granted, I will say, as much as I like the Aquanaut, and strap only, $44,000, there's no other way to say you're going to save a lot of money over the Nautilus on the face of it. Uh, and I love orange straps. I'm all in favor of orange watches. And no matter what strap you select, you're going to have those orange accents on the dial. That said, you can still order a strap for the Nautilus. Patek makes them. You can even get them in rubber if you want to take advantage of the water resistance. They both have the same water resistance. Go 5980 and never look back here. You'll thank me. And down the road, your kids will thank you. All right. I can see right here Celestial Fix saying 75 grand for a used steel Patek Philippe Nautilus is insane. True, but it's also a safe $75,000 if you're going to put that kind of money into a watch. And I can see right here we have a uh, comment from BS saying get a VC overseas. I am so with you on that. Get a pre-owned overseas for a quarter the price of that Nautilus Chrono and never look back. I like the brown dial. Okay, jumping back into the flow tonight. Uh, I can also see Clive Watch Wrangler saying anywhere overseas. Yep, pretty much. Okay, primary feature, mainstream brands overlooked dive watches. So we're taking mainstream blue chip brands and we're taking a mainstream product class, but we're looking at overlooked models that I think deserve a second look. Tonight we're talking about Omega, Rolex, and Breitling, but we're not discussing the IT watches of the moment. At Omega, we're not talking about the 25th anniversary SMP Diver 300 meter at Breitling. We're not talking about the Navitimer 8. And at Rolex, we're not talking about the redesigned Sea Dweller in the dive class, the Deep Sea Sea Dweller, I should say, or the Pepsi GMT. Dive watches, though, here's the thing. Dive watches are the single most popular class of watch. And in the luxury marketplace, they could be called the all-arounder, the one you wear to the office, uh, the boardroom or the boardwalk, the business suit or the bathing suit. And these are the divers that get lost in the undertow. And here's why you need to reconsider them for your wrists. Remember guys, tonight we're not talking about whether you should get on dealer waiting lists now to have your unborn child's college graduation Pepsi GMT ready for the class of 2042. These are all watches flying under the radar and more or less available. The Omega Seamaster 1200 meter needs some love from you guys. Let me explain. Of course, nobody calls it that. Its friends call it the Ploprof after the original Ploprof, the Plongeur Professionnel of the early 1970s, developed for Comex but never used as such. Uh, this was a watch originally called officially the Plongeur Professionnel 600 meter Seamaster. Now, today, the Ploprof is on paper the flagship of the Seamaster collection, but it seems to vanish alongside the mainstream Planet Oceans, the hype of the James Bond SMP 300 meter divers, and the more accessible nostalgia play of the Seamaster 300s and the versatile Aquaterras. In the wake, and this is where this started in the modern era, of the epic Antiquorum Omega Mania auction of 2007, which pulled in three times the aggregate estimate at about 5.5 million back then, Omega rushed to relaunch the Ploprof, which was hot at auction, as a 2009 model year revival. But the 2009 model year watch with that 2009 model year case back was a much bigger 48 by 55 millimeter watch enclosing a coaxial escapement for the first time an actual helium escape valve and probably the most sophisticated bezel assembly you're going to find on any modern diver short of Richard Mille. So after limited sales, Omega made another push with the 2015 model in titanium sans date with a clean dial, master chronometer status, a new 8912 movement, and now a display case back and ceramic rather than the original Blancpain style sapphire capped bezel. Both are still available in the model line, and it's still priced like a flagship as you'll pay between 9400 and about 18000 for the titanium and Sedna gold model. So it's a very expensive watch. It's also huge, awkward, and a specialty piece, which is why few are sold. But this is why I love it and why I beg you to at least consider it. First, rarity, uniqueness, and rugged individualism. Don't be afraid to be different. Everyone else is going to have the Bond Seamaster. Everyone else is going to have the easy nostalgia of the Seamaster 300. And yes, I would say globally, the Aquaterra is probably the most popular sports watch Omega makes. 
No one else is gonna have one of these. So consider yourself a little bit of a maverick if you're wearing that thing. And be confident in the fact that you've got impeccable taste in engineering, and you can explain that to everyone who questions your fashion sense. This is a cerebral watch. Okay, now, pre-owned Nirvana. I mentioned you can pay up to 18,000 for one of these, and they pretty much start just under 10 grand. But you can pay $5,000 and get the original one, the 2009 version with the date and the caliber 8500, the, the map. It's not a master chronometer, it's a coaxial chronometer, but you can get that original model for five grand, and for about six grand, you can get it on the bracelet. So this is serious. For the price of a 39 millimeter Oyster Perpetual and two grand less than a no-date sub, you could have the Ploprof with all of the technology that entails. Also, for about $7,500, you can get the 2015 model, which has all of the bells and whistles with no compromise. Get the 2015 model, and now you've got a watch that retails in titanium with a bracelet for 13 grand and you can buy these for just under 8,000 pre-owned. Okay, ergonomics, guys. Don't question my sanity. Yes, it measures a huge 55 millimeters laterally from that crown to its opposite side, 55 millimeters, but it's 48 lug to lug, which means lug to lug, it's actually three millimeters shorter than a Rolex sub on a solid end link bracelet. That shark proof bracelet may not be shark proof, but it is wonderfully, wonderfully comfortable and the ergonomics are so good, you could wear this all the time and feel like you're wearing a 42, 41 millimeter steel watch. Technical virtuosity, that extraordinary bezel mechanism, the incredible degree of sealing that goes into a watch conservatively rated at 1200 meters and tested to 25% beyond that. This is a watch that brings all the bells and whistles you could want with an epic clasp that gives you both an all or nothing extension and a push button incremental slider for two whole imperial inches of extension. Metric folks, that's over 50 millimeters. This is a watch you need to consider. As crazy as it is, it's actually a sound investment from a pre-owned perspective. Okay, guys, I can see right here, TMO8320 saying, Yowzers, that's a fact. And Captain Zed, that watch would snap a flimsy NATO. You might be surprised at how light it is in titanium. Give it a chance. And I can see right here, Edward Ledden saying, I think Agnelli had a Ploprof. That's the rake of the Riviera, the late Gianni Agnelli of Fiat. He probably owned the original 600 meter. I can see Alvin saying, this for a diver, but for daily use, nope. I challenge that notion. I would wear it every day. I'm a little bit wacky but I'm not crazy. I'm nuts, but I'm not crazy. Okay, now, the name. The name we've already brought up in this episode, Rolex, and a watch we've already seen thanks to our friend Ball Y. It is the Rolex Sea Dweller 43 Red Anniversary, the 126600. So you're asking, how can a watch launched one year ago already find itself on the island of misfit toys? Admit it, you get the reference. You wouldn't admit it publicly, but you get the reference. Well, here's the thing. Yes, it shone brightly for its moment. It was the 50th anniversary of the original Rolex Sea Dweller, a watch designed for Comex and actually used by Comex in the late 60s through the 70s. Now, here's the thing. This one hasn't had the market legs of the green sub. It hasn't had the market legs of the steel ceramic Rolex Daytona. It, somehow it got a little lost in the shuffle. There was a lot going on in 2017 and for 2018 for that matter. Although technically the star of Rolex's Basel World 2017, the 50th anniversary revival of the Red Sea Dweller did get somewhat buried and eclipsed. And this, this Red Sea Dweller is the real deal. It's the first red in quite a few decades. But Rolex's own Oyster Flex Daytonas sort of stole the headlines last year. Even in precious metal, those things were red hot. And then of course there was the newly accessible and so suddenly desirable Rolex Skydweller in steel. At one third its original price, yeah, suddenly the GMT annual calendar became red hot. So the red Sea Dweller got a little bit lost as a bit of a back catalog entry for the year. And 2018 brought a revised and upgraded deep sea now with the three day movement. So that's really just adding insult to injury. Today, pre-owned dealers keep multiple examples of the Sea Dweller 43 stocked at all times. So the market was sated long ago. 
Use this to your advantage. First, that's a great watch. If you own that watch, I'm legitimately jealous. It's a watch I would own with pride because it's a great product. Excruciatingly planned and executed by Rolex for the anniversary of one of its most important models, I think we will appreciate that watch more as a milestone 10, 20 years from now than we do 10, 20 months from its release. And here's the other thing. The Reborn Red Sea Dweller is not so easily dismissed, more wearable even than the new Deep Sea. Yes, the new Deep Sea is a little bit smaller at the margins. It's still not as wearable as this. This can be worn with a dress cuff. No Deep Sea, even the 2018, can be reliably worn with a dress cuff. So keep that in mind. And remember that this watch is also a lot more technically sophisticated than the aging Submariner. It gives you the new 3235 three day movement with the Chrono G escapement, the bigger main spring, the reprofiled uh, wheels, and of course, superlative chronometer plus two minus two is a very conservative 24 hour accuracy rating for this watch. And it gives you the same upgraded clasp as featured on the previous Sea Dweller 40. You don't get a flip lock extension and glide lock on a sub. You do get it with this. I should also mention that this is a watch that is a relatively secure way to store your money because whereas many of the hottest Rolex watches at the moment, and we've, we've discussed them at length tonight, are not going to be able to maintain twice MSR RP for long. This watch, which trades at about one to two thousand dollars above retail, can be counted on as a relatively secure store of your money, and this is just more fun than owning U.S. Treasuries or German bonds. Let's face it, you can't wear those on the wrist. This you can, and it's a fairly safe way to spend your money for the long term or medium term. Guys, let's see what you're saying right here. I can see Edward Ledden believes it's a cool watch for not for him, but not for him. G Manic is asking better than the James Cameron. I think it probably is more versatile because the James Cameron is a deep sea and the deep sea is huge. This is a lot smaller than the deep sea. It's closer to the Submariner than the deep sea in size. Even though the deep sea is a 44 and this is a 43, this is more like the sub in terms of how it wears. And Bill Cosgrave is saying it can be worn with dress attire. Yes, it can. It can be worn under your French cuffs with absolutely no obstruction. Jumping back to our faves, I can see uh, Fjord Prefix saying, I didn't know that the Sea Dweller 50th anniversary was a backseat model. All the buzz is gone. At this point, the people buying them are the ones who really like them for what they are. The hype is dead, and that's actually a good thing if you're buying, because it means your money is relatively safe, and you're not paying for hype. Okay, here's the odd man out of the three, as well as the most underrated model of the night. Breitling, as a brand, is having a little bit of trouble these days staying neck and neck with its traditional rivals, Omega and Rolex, but we're not gonna discount it from the traditional big three. Tonight, we're talking about the Breitling Super Ocean 244 millimeter, a watch that in its latest iteration bought at Basel World 2015. Right now, the Super Ocean Heritage is Breitling's best selling model. And I have to admit, this undersold Super Ocean 2 is not part of the Super Ocean Heritage line. So it's not one of the cool kids. Don't discount it. The 44 millimeter Super Deuce is a much tougher basher of a watch than the previous two models we've discussed tonight. It's a watch we would love to death if the dial said made in Germany. Admit it, we would. And here's why. At $4,150 on the bracelet, under four grand on the strap, the model isn't trying to rival Rolex or move up market to tackle the Omega Planet Oceans. This is a rival to something like a Zin U1, a Seiko Prospects SLA-19, or a Doxa Sub 1200T or 1500T. Those are your comparables for this, and you need to think of it with that mindset. Something tank tough, able to take a pounding, but still give you the luxury experience and the Swiss pedigree. You get a lot for your money, and let's talk about what you get. You get a captive bezel. So what's a captive bezel? It's a bezel that is not snapped on, but held in place by screws that go in laterally. Zinn uses it to great effect, and you'll find it here. What whereas Zinn gets a lot of credit for all of its technologies, like tough bezels, Breitling rarely gets a shout out for using the exact same design on everything they make with a rotating bezel. So you've got that going for you. You've also got a monstrous case. When we actually do a water testing of these in our intake and our watchmaking department, we have to use an incompressible case setting on the water tester because the water tester works by compressing and decompressing the case and on Breitlings it can't get any give. That's how solidly these are made. 
all of the water resistance ratings are conservative. Also, consider a chronometer movement based on a 2824 ETA, but it's the highest grade chronometer spec, which means that you're getting Swiss precision at the highest level and it's serviceable anywhere. We talked about the problems with Damasco and their new DC-80 Chrono. Great technology, proprietary everything on the inside, but really only they're equipped to service it. Not the case here. A first-year watch student in China could service this thing and make it run COSC. Now, 1,000 meter rating with a helium escape valve. Do you need a 1,000 meter dive watch? Probably not, but Whereas Rolex would sell that kind of thing as a feature and an upgrade over its standard sub, you don't get either with a Submariner, Breitling gives it to you standard on the Super Ocean 244, and I think we need to acknowledge that. A watch that's tougher at 1,000 meters is going to be tougher when you beat the crap out of it on your desk. When you hit that ultra-thick crystal and that captive bezel against a doorknob, it's going to come back to you in one piece. That's the advantage of having a watch overbuilt for the deep that you're going to wear on the surface. And finally, a comfortable bracelet that won't let go. It's the Pro 3. The Pro 3 bowed in 2012. It's the asymmetrical link slash cut. It's not sophisticated. What it is is tough, durable, and comfortable. And all of those sound like the perfect recipe for a tasty dive watch solution. Finally, guys, everything comes down to money. And you can buy these Super Ocean 44s all day long for $2,600 to about three grand. $2,600 on a strap, $3,000 on a bracelet pre-owned. All of a sudden, you're lining it up against watches that you would never ordinarily compare to a Swiss-made chronometer. And it deserves your respect for that reason. Is this the finest luxury diver? No. Is it a good one? Nope. It's a great one. Okay, guys, right here, best article of the week. This is a bit of a throwback, hands-on with the limited edition Grand Seiko High Beat 36,000 GMT SBG J021. Guys, it's a throwback article because I wanted to get something that would serve as a primer for an entire brand, and this does it well. We're going back through the Wayback Machine to December 2016, and link in the description, guys. This is by watch industry veteran Robert Yan Brower, founder and proprietor of Fratello Watches. And it's a thorough evaluation and account of the Grand Seiko High Beat GMT SBGJ021, a 2016 model year special series of 500 pieces. Everything you ever wanted to know about why folks love Grand Seiko and what makes the brand different is contained in this five minute read. So, in addition to being a showcase for the watch by one of the greats in watch journalism, it's objectively also a great showcase for Grand Seiko as a brand. I'll also say this, Robert Yan's article is a quick and focused quickie. If you're on the train, if you're commuting, he employs few but excellent photographs to illustrate lavishly the exotic rotor in oxidized titanium and tungsten carbide. He shows you the exceptional case finish, the Zeratsu polish you've heard of, the tin plate polishing. You can see it in detail thanks to his photos, and you can also see the polyhedron case style that makes Grand Seiko's case design different from what you get at Breitling, Rolex, and Omega for the same price. The article nicely frames the creative process at Grand Seiko's factories while highlighting the mechanical and stylistic strengths of the particular watch model. In short, it's an entertaining and informative article that also works as a great way to get psyched about Grand Seiko if you haven't already. If you don't have time for endless forum testimonials and nerdery, this is a place to start. Okay, viewer wrist shots, guys. A few more of my friends, and I'm going to announce who won the Oris Arctic's Audi Sport GMT. Let me, let me pull it out because I've got it with me. Guys, this is where things get insane. We're getting serious now. I've got a real Swiss watch worth 2,500 bucks that I'm going to give away to you within seconds. Okay, Abdul R flying low with a Zin. I love that salmon guilloche dial on a Zin chronograph. I'm wearing a Zin chronograph at the moment. Getting back from vacation, ready to start work. Abdul, thank you so much. Now, we jump quickly back to the Oris that I'm giving away. That's it, guys. It's going to be one of yours in a moment. Let's jump back to our viewer wrist shots. Rob N. and his Longines Chrono with a beautifully composed aqua shot. I love that beautiful aquamarine blue at poolside. A beautiful shot, nicely staged. If there's one thing I can appreciate as an artist, it's composition. Alan D. bought this Nomos Club Atlantic Blau from the watch box. Thank you for trusting our company. And you can see it on his wrist, beautifully matched with an Audi S5, a watch and a car I adore both. 
Uh, Trim D of Denmark specifically noted in his email of this wrist shot that he has no Audi or Benz, but I give enthusiastic plaudits for his choice of a green Rolex and bicycle. You know I love bikes and green for that matter. Okay, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Now, I'm about to give an Oris and a very cool Oris Field Compass, itself a $50 value, out to one of our viewers. And the winner of our sweepstakes among 9,731 unique entries is Cam Nadeau from the UK. Cam, thank you for following us. I think I recognize your name from the chat box. You actually found us and this raffle through YouTube. Guys, if you didn't win, first, thank you for entering. Second, there's gonna be another watch right after this one. And again, let me give you a quick look at what you've won. Cam, congratulations. You're our big winner for this month, but we're gonna be giving away Swiss mechanical watches and maybe a few German pieces going forward. This is an Oris compass and an Oris watch ready for the 24 hours of Le Mans 2018, the Oris Artix Audi Sport GMT. Guys, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Cam, congratulations. Everyone who commented, I always read all your comments after the show. For my crew who stuck around for a 40 minute broadcast, thank you. You guys give me the best job in the world. Time out, Tim out, thanks for logging on.